Be seated. It's a new year. And you can just say that. It's a new year. I'm so thankful for that. I started my year off like I always do. I, I, uh, I, I'm kind of a New Year's resolution. Okay? I know some of you are, you don't want to hear that, but I, I am. I like to try to redefine goals and look at myself and say, what do I need to do to get better? And I was praying and just asking God that he uses me in whatever place. Now, it's always a scary prayer, you know, when you say, use me in whatever place. But I was finished that prayer, and I uh, went out to check my phone because we live in no man's land. I have to leave my phone outside just to get service. But anyway, so I go out there and look, and, and uh, the family of, of Dev Mole had got a hold of me and asked me to do that funeral. And just a lump in my throat, and I was just thinking, you know, there's a lot of other things I'd rather do than a funeral. But at the same time, God uses us anywhere. And I just ask for your prayers. Because that's, that's, there's, there's funerals that I always say, it, it's, they're hard. They're hard funerals. It's, it's, it's just one of those. And that, that's a hard one. That's one that's, 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 that's not going to be an easy funeral. And it's uh, one that I want to make sure to, to reach out to the family and just, just help them through this time. So I ask for your prayers and, and the prayers for the Mole family uh, this week. It is a new year, and I, I am glad 20's gone. I'll be honest with you. I'm just, you know, kicked it right out and done with it, okay? But anyway, there was a lot of good things in 20. There's a lot of good things in 20. When I look back to 20, there's there's a lot of things I say, I thank God for. You know one thing we did? We spent more time as a family. I don't know about you. Spent more time as a family. It was good. It was, it was good. We had some good fishing in 2020, didn't we, kids? They still can't outfish your grandpa, I'm telling you. They're trying, man. <laughs> But anyway, it's, we had a lot of fun. We, we enjoyed that. And, and there's a lot of goals set for, for 2021 that focuses on the family. I hope church, that's the way we are. I hope we look at our family, not only our immediate family, but our church family. And I hope that is where 21 goes. But I want to give you an encouraging sermon to embrace 21 with and to set some goals. And I think it's important. God asks us to continue to move, okay? Uh this morning, I went out and uh, my morning ritual go out for dad and get him up and get him going. And, and uh, the movement today was so slow that I was like, you're not going to church today. <laughs> you know, it was, there was no movement. You get, I told dad, I said, dad, I'm having to drive a post to see whether you're moving or not. And uh, so anyway, I think God wants to see us move as believers. I think when we set in one spot, God is going to put something in front of us to move us, okay? And I hope that that's what he's doing. But in, Pro, in Philippians 3, 13 through 14, that's a scripture we're going to look at. It says, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forget what is behind and strain forward to what is ahead. I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Forget what is behind. Behind, I got that man. That's a beautiful, beautiful scripture there. Forget what is behind. I think this is so important as a believer that we do this. I don't know what you need to do that, that you need to forget what is behind, but it is a must that you do that if you ever want to move forward. Past will absolutely keep us from doing kingdom work, period. Our past will keep us from being a believer. Our past will keep us from being the, the person that God has created us to be. Listen, look at this scripture. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is what? A new creation. Guess what's happened? The old is gone and the new is here. And this is where you're at today as a believer. I think some of us need to have that scripture on our fridge or wherever we go. We are a new creation. Okay? The new has come. The old is gone. Let it go. Rip the rearview mirror off of your vehicle. Stop looking behind. It is so important as believers that we do that. I look at 20, and you know what? 20 has gone now. I'm done with it. I'm not going to look behind. I'm not going to lament. I'm not going to say, I wish this would have happened and that would happen. I praise God that we serve a God that is beyond us and, and, and is in complete control of everything. Amen. We need to remember that as, as we live for Jesus. 
The psalmist says it this way. He brought them out of darkness, the utter darkness, and broke away their chains. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind, for he breaks down the gates of bronze and cuts through bars of iron. That's the God we serve. See, many of us can stay chained. And I even believe as believers, sometimes this takes place. As believers, we still stay shackled. As believers, we just don't trust God. Listen, we need to allow God to say, hey, listen, you need to be done with your past. I don't know what's in your past. I don't care. I'll, I'll, I'll be counseling sometimes and people say, well, you don't know, you know where I've been. I, I don't care. That's the first thing I say. I don't really care. Where are you going from now forward? I can remember as a parent. You know, as a proud parent, we think our kids will never make a mistake, right? We are quickly humbled, right? Quickly. I mean, quickly humbled. And guess what happens? Sometimes we have to even eat a little crow as a parent, right? We do that. We, you know, it goes down hard. Okay, but anyway, so, so when we, when I would talk to the kids, I would say, and, and here we are, they've just done something I never dreamed they would do. And you're sitting there going, well, that was stupid. I'm just, I wasn't, I've never been one that, that likes to clean my words up. Really. I was, if it's I was a, something stupid, it was stupid, okay? You know, I had family say, we don't use that word. Well, we do in our house, okay? <laughs> okay, sorry. I just, I use the word, okay? So you don't have to, I do. But anyway, so I, I, but, but I would follow that with this. But you know what? It only matters where we're going for now. Where are we going now? Because the past is the past. We can't change the past, can we? You ever try to do that? Not going to happen, is it? You're not going to change the past. What you're going to have to do is say, the past is a past. All those things I've done in the past. Listen, people will come to me and say this. And I've told you this before. I cannot believe you're a preacher based off my past. And I'm going, really? <laughs> you know, I'd like to talk about you for a second. <laughs> I mean, seriously, we all have past. You know, you know but great. The apostle Paul's writing this. You think Paul had a past? Read the book of Acts. Read the book of Acts. <laughs> Don't let your chains or those chains that Satan uses to hold us back, hold us back. Get rid of them. Let him go. God releases us from them. I love this. God wants to set us free. He wants to set us free from our past. And he says to the Jews... Who had believed in him, Jesus said, I hold, or if you hold to my teaching. In other words, if you believe in me and follow me, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants, and have never been slaves to anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? It says, Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Oh, he changes it now. He says, your past, your sinful past. It says, now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. For if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I love that scripture. There is freedom in Christ and no one else, Okay. We are sitting here today, everybody in this group, everybody in this body of Christ that have given their lives to Jesus Christ have been set free. I don't care what your baggage is. It doesn't matter to me. I don't care what sin you think you've committed that God can't forgive. The last I checked, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and purify us from all, not most, not almost all, but all unrighteousness. I like that. That's a good scripture. We use it a lot. It's important. It says the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. That's what Satan says. Oh, you know what you're deserving of? Yeah. Or repay us according to our iniquities. Praise God for that. For as high as the heavens are above the earth... So great is his love for those who fear him. Now look, I love the scripture. It says, as far as the east is from the west, as far 
It says, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Remember the prodigal son? He was way off when his father sees him. And his father just sits there and waits. No, he goes and embraces him. Listen, God just wants you to trust him. And he knows that when that takes place, when your faith is placed in him, guess what? Those sins are removed. He doesn't have an account for him. He doesn't have them in a book somewhere where someday he'll go. <laughs> Not getting in here. They're removed. The blood of Jesus is so powerful that it says it cleanses us from all sin. Praise God for that. I, uh, I think of that word, purify. That word purify, to make pure, to purify, to cleanse. And that is what, what it's talked about there is a moral cleansing. I want you to look at Peter. It says, for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from your empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. And it says, but it was with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish, or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world. It says, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him, you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him so that your faith and hope are in God. Now look closely at 22. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, see that you have a sincere love for each other. Love one another deeply from the heart. Let your past yeah. Now, I want to say that sometimes some of us need to go make something right, okay? You don't, you don't right or wrong. I'll, I'll never forget. I've, I've shared this story before. It's just such a good story, so you're going to get to hear it again. <laughs> Shocker. I'm competitive, okay? <laughs> I don't care what we're playing. It could be slapjack. could be softball. Well, this happened to be softball. And so, and I'm just competitive, and, and I love to win. I don't play a game to have a green. I never forget when they gave a green for participation. And I thought, what is this ribbon? I was there for the purple, not for the green, okay? So anyway, I, I, not saying anything is green, it's okay. But, so I'm in a softball game, and there's this beast of a guy that's playing softball against me. I know, a lot of you have heard the story. You get hurt again. It's just a good story. So anyway, he has hit a home run every pitch that's been thrown. All right? Every pitch. It's just like, guy has that down. You know, you ever watch these old guys play softball? This guy just, just boom, gone. I happen to be the pitcher that day. <laughs> I'm thinking, he ain't hitting my first pitch, I'll tell you that. So I just chucked the first three way, way, way outside where he couldn't get it. And then... The next pitch, you know, I'm thinking, okay, the first three pitches. So you know what that guy does? On a couple of them, he just swings. So pretty soon I'm thinking, all right, there's a 3-2 count here, okay? One more pitch and I strike that guy out. Or he hits a long one. So I gave him everything I got, and he takes a wicked swing and misses. And I did what any good Christian would do. I just shot him down. <laughs> I ruined my side. That was what any good Christian would do, right? No, that was not what any good Christian would do. He was a little hot. We had a few words, and like a good Christian, I'm not even going to repeat what I said. <laughs> that was a war between him and I for a long time. He didn't like me, and I don't know why. <laughs> I returned the favor right back. But I'll never forget when that family moved. He called me up. Now, here I am. I'm supposed to be the bigger Christian. I'm not moving, okay? I shot that guy down well. And I'm not moving. And he calls me up. He says, I want to talk to you about something. And he just said he was sorry. Do you know what that made me feel like? A dirty, rotten scoundrel that I was. Right? I mean, seriously. 
You know, why couldn't I have made that? I learned from that mistake. That's never happened. And pray, I pray to God it never does. That man called me and apologized. And he didn't say, and you need to too. He just left at that. And I apologized too. The sad thing was it took him to do it first. Sometimes... This is an important scripture, people. Don't forget this. Therefore, if, if, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in the front of the altar. First and go be reconciled to him. Then come on. That scripture, if we've not done this, should haunt us. It should. This is a hard one. I know there are times in our life where there's just, <laughs> it's been difficult with people. So it's even sad when it's in the body of Christ. Jesus knows the importance of this. And he says, listen, this is going to happen. Or he wouldn't even say it. It's going to happen, okay? So when it happens, what we need to do is make sure that, that this Sunday worship isn't a time where it's just God and I and the rest of the world doesn't matter. No, the rest of the world doesn't matter. It does matter. As a believer, it does. Your light does matter to this world out there. And God says, I want you to go get right first. That's what that word reconcile is. Make it right. Get it right. And then come back. And then come back in. And so when I say forget your past, sometimes we got to go address it. Okay? And it's okay. But what Paul says is, and I think Paul did address his past. I think he did address his past with Stephen, the killing of Stephen. I think he did have to address his past. But he finally said, I'm going to leave it alone. I'm going to move on beyond this. I'm going to strain forward to what lies ahead. So what is it that lies ahead? I thought about that for a second. What is it that lies ahead? Now, I love this picture in Abraham. or I love this picture in Hebrews where it talks about Abraham. Because this is what lies ahead, okay? It says, by faith, Abraham would call to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. It says, by faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger to foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. What a picture of faith. What a picture of, of straining forward to what is ahead. You know what Abraham's called? He doesn't know exactly what's all going to be there, but he's going to move. You know why? Because he believes God. He trusts God. He doesn't get to see everything. God doesn't say, here's where you're going to go, Abraham. Here's exactly what's going to happen. Here's what no, God just says, I am going to bless you if you move. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you be? You ought to live godly, or excuse me, holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. How, sometimes I chuckle at that scripture because sometimes we want to speed it up, don't we? Speed up your coming. It says, that day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire. It says, and the elements will melt in the heat. But it says, but in keeping with his promise. Now, I want you to look at that word promise for a second. It says, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. We are looking forward to what? The promise. Listen, this is a broken world. This is a broken world. I'm looking forward to the day where it's not broken anymore. I'm looking forward to the day where, where death and disease and disaster and all those killers are, are gone. And we're just with God right where we need to be. I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Now I'm getting to my three points. That took me a while to get there. We only have 15 minutes left. Don't worry, I'll get through it. <laughs> What's the prize? Where are we going? What are we straining for? What are we looking forward to? This scripture is this scripture is right on our board, right, kids? My class, this is this what we're talking about every week. It says, Do you not know 
that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets a prize. Run in such a way to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to a crown to get a to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. The apostle Paul compares this Christian faith, the Christian walk to what? In this case, he's saying the Olympics. Okay, this is going to be something that is not just this quick, quick little sprint and it's over. There, listen, as a believer, I want you to look closely at this. As a believer, we will need to go into strict training. Period. Okay? When you accept Jesus as Christ, you are saying no to self and yes to what he has ahead of you. And what he has ahead of you is going to require training. We're going to talk about a few of those things that, that it requires because there's something that it requires. I like this. It says whether one is an athlete or a Christian, and we're going to look at this real quickly, there are three things necessary to obtain the prize, okay? The Apostle Paul is saying you're going to go into strict training, and here's your three points. This is what you're going to need to do to obtain the prize. It's going to, number one, Take motivation. I'll never forget sitting down with some kids to teach them basketball. And I could always tell you which ones probably would succeed and which ones wouldn't. Now, I tried not to tell them that because sometimes things change. But that word right there usually meant the ones that would prosper. Motivation. Got to be motivated, right? There's got to be a motivation. You, you as a believer need to look back at the things that you've done in life that you succeeded in. And, and Paul is saying our, our uh, run or our life as a Christian is going to be compared very much like an athlete. Okay? And it's going to require, it's going to require motivation. The life of Christ is going to require motivation as we walk through this life. Now look what the Apostle Paul says as he closes out his life. Now this is not how Paul began. We saw how Paul began. Paul's introduced in the New Testament. In the book of Acts. Remember that? Remember the first words that we find that name Saul? Remember what happened? He just got done stoning a man by the name of Stephen, a Christian. Okay? That's when we first learned about Paul. That's where it began. That's where we first see the apostle Paul. Okay? His life changed. Things had to change in Paul's life. He had to become a motivated believer. And now look how he closes out his life. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I've kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And it says, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. The apostle Paul again compares Christianity to, to these games, these, these Greek games that he was very aware of that was, that was going on at all times. He's saying, you know what? It's going to be a fight. To be a believer, it, you're going to have to be motivated because we're in a fight every day. That's why Paul says, I buffet my body down. I have to look at myself. I have to say, am I doing what I need to be doing? But Peter says it this way. Praise be to the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It says, in his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. Okay? He's saying this. Now, now listen. If that doesn't motivate us. I don't know what's going to motivate you. I have no clue. I'm telling you, agreeing for participation doesn't motivate me. A crown that is going to perish or tarnish or in 10 years I won't even know where it's at is not something that excites me. It doesn't excite me, okay? A new car doesn't excite me. A new house doesn't excite me. You know why? I get old. You ever know that? Look at all. 
They just don't stay new. And God is saying, that, listen, I want you to understand something. The things of this world will perish. It's a guarantee. But let me tell you what won't perish. That's what I've got for you. Now that motivates me. All of a sudden, you put something out in front of someone, it will motivate them to do God's will. We will begin to desire to do God's will. Look at this. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, I wish I could just stop and spend an hour on this. But I want you to know what's going on here. We as Christians are living out our life right now with a great crowd of witnesses surrounding us, cheering us on. Isn't that a great picture? The stadium's full. It's a packed arena, and you're in it. And, and we got a great cloud. You know who the cloud of witnesses are? <laughs> Those people in Hebrews 11. Go read them. And I'm telling you, there's a great crowd. They're rooting us on. And, and, and it says, because of this, because of our prize that is going to be inherited, it says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run, now look closely, with perseverance, the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. Satan has a way to take our eyes off you, doesn't he? And that's so easy. Oh, man. It says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning and shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We have got to get Jesus in front of us. We need to keep our focus on Christ. Don't take your eyes off of him. Okay. We have to desire we have to desire to be a part of his kingdom. It says, therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Now look closely. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. I love that scripture. The problem is, are you tasting him? That's the problem. Here we are, we're Christians, and, and a lot of us don't know Jesus. Now, I'm not, I mean, yes, we know Jesus. He died on the cross, that's what I was saying. But I mean, really get to know him. There are people that are in marriages today for years and years and years don't know each other. There's people that are married to Christ that really haven't embraced it. You want to know why? Because they've tasted everything else. They forget to taste him. He's got every good blessing for us. Number one, motivation. Number two, self-control. Oh, you know that last part of the fruit of the Spirit? It closes out self-control. Mm, self-control. The virtue of one who masters his desires and passions, especially his sensual appetites. That's what self-control is. Self-control for the athlete. Wow, it takes a lot. They got a diet, follow their sleep, follow their training schedule. Uh, you know, whether you like him or not, a little different guy, but Lance Armstrong was quite an athlete. God. Great, I don't agree with everything he did, but quiet. But there's what he said. Self-control means doing it even when one doesn't feel like it. When it is pouring, pouring rain and you have to go and ride six hours in the mountains, there's no fun in doing that. Let me tell you what I said when my kids came to me and said, Dad, I just don't feel like doing it. I did what any good compassionate father would do. I got down and I said, suck it up! <laughs> There's a lot of things I don't feel like doing. Right? Really, seriously. Let me ask you a question. Anybody does exactly what they want to do every single day they live and just everything's just perfect for them? Because you got to finish a sermon out if that's happening. I, there's a lot of things I don't. I got, you know what? There's, in fact, I can take my list out and I can write my list out for the day, and I may not even hit 50 50. 50% of those things I don't want to do. But I do them because I need to do them. That's what we do. We knew it. You know, honey, put a smile on your face. Fake it till you make it. I don't care what you got to do, but you suck it up. And let me tell you why. Because God has a prize that this world doesn't have for you. And don't forget that. And don't forget that. Don't you be motivated about living in this world. You be motivated about the world that's ahead of you. 
Don't you get so caught up in this world that you think, oh, this is so great. Because this isn't great. The minute you think it's great, let me tell you what God is a way of humbling us. And then something happens in your life. It's like an earthquake. It's like a tsunami. And all of a sudden, you were, you were just cruising along. And your life got shaken. And that's the days where perspective changes. And all of a sudden, we look to God and says, there's got to be more than this. And that's what God wants us to do. And, and he says, listen, I need you. I need you to have self-control. I need you to go through the spiritual exercise that it's going to take. Yeah, it's going to feel difficult. Yeah, you're not going to feel like it. I hate exercise. I raised two kids that don't like it. Their mother loves it. I'm like, she's crazy. <laughs> you know, get up. She gets up and does her exercise. I'm thinking, you're a nut. I, I'll tell you what exercise I'm going to do. I'm going to eat and drink my coffee. That is drinking coffee's exercise, if you think about it. <laughs> well, I love coffee, and I love that exercise. I don't want to go ride a bike. I don't want to. Listen, any of you guys got a stepper? <laughs> they don't go anywhere. <laughs> They're standing there going, you don't think where are you going, huh? You're going to be at the same place where you started. Nowhere. I'm serious. That's the way I think of exercise. And let me tell you, both my kids embrace that. <laughs> Diana goes there, definitely fighters, without a doubt. I go, listen, we don't like, as a believer, God says, it's important. Now, I'm going to talk about this exercise important because it is important. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of your flesh. And don't look at that clock because we're going to go past, Okay. I just some good stuff here. It says, and if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who's raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit. I know I can self-control, I can't do it, but you know what? God bless me. Because you know what he put inside of me that helps me deal with it? The Holy Spirit. My spirit says I don't want to do it. The Holy Spirit says, You can do it. You can do it. Okay? It says. He, and that spirit, you know that spirit did? It says that raised Christ from the dead and will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. It says, therefore, brothers and sisters, now look closely. Look at, the apostle Paul didn't change it. He says, you have a, you know what that word means? Obligation. You are obligated. But it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. It says, but if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Things will seem difficult at times. There'll be times that we go, we don't want to do it. But God says, listen, I know that. I know your flesh. I know what happens. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit and he's going to help you. He's going to help you love. He's going to help you do things you never thought you could do. Okay, that's his Holy Spirit. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain. As a child growing up, I hated that word. Because parents would use it on you. Be their trump card. You know, I, I need you to abstain. We don't want to abstain from the sinful desires which wage war against your soul. You want to know why they wanted us to do that? Because they knew the world had nothing for us. And they knew if we followed those sinful desires we would die. They do that. So thankful for parents that did that, okay, that preached that. Self-control is necessary. Proper motivation is necessary. And then the third is, is, is that spiritual exercise. That exercise that, that we're going to, I was just reading, long distance runners train 10 to 20 miles a day. They would get up at my house and run to good. I will swear on my, I, I, I will never be a long distance player, okay? That's not going to happen. Swimmers swim 10 miles a day to be competitive. I'm not doing that. Gymnasts work out eight to nine hours a day. I'm not doing that. Uh, unbelievable. You look at that, but you know what? They're motivated. They're motivated. They're self-controlled. They say, I want to win a prize. And, and Paul said, their prize is going to be gone. But we as Christians need to understand that. And what he's saying is, grab a hold of that and understand we are going to have to spiritually exercise. Now, what does that mean? And here's what he says. This physical training is of some value. I underline some, okay? 
But godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. I'm telling you what. Here's what he says. Exercise will help you and benefit you now. Now, this is spiritual exercise. Now and in the life to come. Isn't that a beautiful thing? That's what you and I are preparing for. You and I are exercising. We are going through it. Listen, I mean, what is good spiritual exercise? It says, do your best to present to God as one approved. We're going to give everything we got to, to, to present ourselves to God as one approved. A worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. God wants us to embrace his word. God wants us to diligently see the scriptures. I love when... when, when, when uh, when it was said that the Bereans were of more noble character. You want to know why they were of more no, noble character? Because they searched the scriptures. And I think it's important. You and I need to be in the word of God, searching the scriptures, understanding how to handle them. I'm going to tell you what, babes in Christ don't know always how to handle the word of God. Okay? As you grow, we learn how to handle that. I would not handle the Bible the same way I would have 20 years ago, would you? Do you have the same ideas today that you did back then? No. You know why? You're growing. That's a good thing, okay? I like this. Philippians 4, 6 through 7 says, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Here's, here's the picture of this exercise. He's, he says, I want you to dive into the word of God. I want you to diligently look at the scriptures. Then what I need you to do is you need to, in every situation, by what? Prayer and petition. We need to be praying people, but don't forget the next words after that. Prayer and petition with what? Thanksgiving. Very important in our life. We are going to be thankful. God, I'm thankful for what you're delivering me, no matter what it is. I am thankful your deliverance. I'm so thankful for that. And then not only do we pray, not only are we engaged in thanksgiving, not only are we engaged in the word of God, he says then, this scripture has been used a lot. Let's keep using it. It's so important. He says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, whatever is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Now, I'm going to ask the kids in my class, what's another word for think? Meditate. Meditate. That's right. We're meditating. We're learning, by the way. We're learning. <laughs> Meditate. Think. We need, that's what we need to be thinking on. That's what God says. That's exercise. That takes work. You know that? It is easy for Satan to take our minds into a way that we don't want him to go. Right? You ever had that happen? You ever got up and read your Bible? Prayed with thanksgiving? And then engaged in this world? And found out they're not all Christians out there. Did you know that? Mm -mm. We have to think. Our mind has to meditate on those important things. And then it says love, this continues, this Romans 12. It says love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. This whole picture, this, this, always, this scripture here is once great for, for your prayers because it humbles us. It puts us in the right mind. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. God, I, I sometimes pray, God, help me hate what's wrong. Sometimes this is the problem. Satan can make things not look so bad maybe so we don't hate him. And God says, I need you to hate evil. There's one thing. Do not let go. Make sure to hate evil. Cling to what is good. And he continues that scripture. He says, never be lacking in zeal. There you go. But keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. It says, share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. I hope we have a great new year. There's so much there. There is so much for us to look to. There are so many ways that we can better our lives as believers. Our prayer needs to be that. God, make me better than what I was yesterday. That's what exercise is. I'm going to close with this scripture. It says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. 
Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we don't give up. Let's go to God in prayer. God, I know as, as, as 21 is here, the kingdom of God in Goodland is vibrant. Let us, let us take that light into this community. God, I pray that you will touch each one of our lives and have us do what you want us to do. God, I know you've put each one of us in a place, and they're different places. But God, I'll, I want you to charge us, to inspire us, to get us motivated and self-controlled and just programmed into your will. God, let it 2021 be the greatest year of our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name.